The injury bug has officially hit Port St. Lucie as David Peterson and Jose Quintana each went down this weekend. This leads me to ask a simple question. Which player can the Mets least afford to lose this season? That's what we're discussing on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at FinkelsteinRyan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Now, two injuries to the Mets rotation this week, and no reason to be too alarmed just yet, as they might not be significant, but... Certainly, this is why you have as much depth as the Mets brought into camp. Because first off, you got David Peterson gets hit in the foot. So he's got a foot bruise. This is a guy that has had foot injuries in the past. So obviously, you hate to see that. But there is every chance that he's fine come opening day. Jose Quintana, they're not too alarmed yet. He was about to head off to the World Baseball Classic. He exited his start with side tightness. Now, side tightness. Could often mean an oblique injury. Obliques can linger, uh, especially you know if you're looking at a pitcher or even a hitter with the torque they have to generate. So we'll see what that end injury ultimately ends up being. As long as one of the two of them is fine, and the Mets have the depth going into opening day that they can roll out a five-man rotation with Scherzer and Verlander and Sanga atop it, and you know Peterson and Carrasco if Quintana can't go, or the rotation they were going with anyway if Peterson can't go of Quintana and Carrasco, and you still have Tyler McGill, you still have Joey Lucchese, you even have Jose Budo and Elizar Hernandez, so the Mets do have depth in their rotation, but as we look at the upcoming season, a podcast that I've been planning to do, and this just felt like the right time to address it when there has been some injuries, is which player can the Mets least afford to lose this year, and since there is already injuries to the rotation, I figure that's the best place to start, and while it would be devastating to lose any of the top three, particularly the top two with Scherzer and Verlander, I do believe that is the one spot on the roster where you could afford a injury or two even, as long as you have one of the two aces functioning at all times. Because we saw that last year. I mean, there were stretches where the Mets did not have Scherzer or DeGrom, and they won 101 games. Now, they did have a guy in Chris Bassett who might not have the ace-level stuff, But working through a season, he was able to be that type of an ace. He was an ace on some good Oakland Athletic teams. Uh, And so he was able to go out there, especially against bad teams even, and really carve them up. And I I do believe with a a Senga in place, with veterans like Carrasco, Quintana, with guys that have upside like Peterson and McGill, I think the Mets are fine to navigate the regular season. When it comes to the rotation, again, I think as long as you have one of the two throughout the season, you will be fine between Scherzer and Verlander. And it's most important that you have them healthy come October. So that flips entirely when we get to the playoffs. Because then you say, who can you least afford to lose? Suddenly, a guy like a Scherzer or a Verlander skyrockets to the top of the list because you need great starting pitching to make a run out of the World Series. Obviously, you need great starting pitching to get you through a season, but more importantly than great starting pitching atop, you need a lot of good starting pitching. You need depth. And I think the Mets have built that throughout this offseason where you know Tyler McGill, rewind a year ago, in April, the guy was unbelievable. I still think he has that in him. Joey Lucchese has added another pitch coming off Tommy John. I believe it's a cutter, if I'm not mistaken. But he's added another weapon because before, he was pretty much just sinker churve. So if he has a third pitch, he might be able to hang as a starter even more. We'll see how he looks. So far, it's been okay. He's got a long sprint to try to prove himself. And I think there's every chance he ends up in the bullpen in that type of a swingman role. Uh, But he is depth. Jose Budo, 
I actually like Jose Budo. I don't think that he's someone I want to be penciled into the rotation for long stretches, but for spot starts here and there, I think he's going to be okay. So with the depth that's been created, I think the Mets are able to sustain injuries to that rotation in the season and continue to stay afloat and keep winning baseball games. I think when you look at the position player core, this is where I think the injuries are a little bit tougher to sustain. There's some position where the Mets are a little bit more covered than others. Uh, you know, and, and I think even in the bullpen, they have done a great job building depth to have coverage there. But there's a few positions we're going to get to in a minute here where if you look at it, if you lose a Pete Alonzo, a Francisco Lindor, a Brandon Nimmo, a Jeff McNeil, some of your core players, Starling Marte, that's where this conversation gets a little more interesting because there are guys there that you try to think about what the lineup looks like without them for a couple of months, and it's tough to envision it. Whereas you look at the starting rotation, we already know what happens if you lose an ace for the first four months of the season. We just watched it. You would never want it to happen, but if Justin Verlander goes down, as long as Kodai Senga can be some semblance of what Chris Bassett was, and if you get a healthier version of Scherzer, your rotation is probably better than last year because I would say that the Taiwan Walker-Jose Quintana difference isn't much. And I think another year under David Peterson's belt, he's that much better. And I think that you would get more from a Tyler McGill because he was hurt for a lot of the year. So, again, when it comes to that rotation, I think that they have the coverage to be able to sustain injuries. And it's honestly... Of the positional groups the Mets have, their rotation is potentially the deepest. And that's what they did this offseason by addressing the loss of Bassett, DeGrom, and Walker and bringing in Verlander, who I think they believe is going to be healthier than DeGrom, Sanga and Quintana to replace Bassett and Walker. I think they believe they're going to get close to the same production with maybe some more upset from Sanga. Uh, and then beyond that, to go out and you grab an Eleazar Hernandez. Not that I like him, but he's more depth. You know you got Lucchese coming off Tommy John and McGill coming off the injury. So uh, ultimately, that is the place that I think the Mets can actually afford some injuries. But let's get into the places they cannot. We're going to dive deep into the pit, the position players. Excuse me. Just a minute. First, though, are you looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories? This is where you have to try yourself some built bars. What makes built bars so good? I'll tell you. For starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate and they come in unbelievable flavors like the churro, the peanut butter brownie, the coconut almond. These bars are protein bars that actually taste like candy bars while maintaining amazing macros. What's even better, they're healthy. Only 130 calories, only 4 grams of sugar, a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now, you don't have to wait around for a box because for years I've been telling you, Go to built.com, grab your built bars. And personally, I still actually do that because I like myself a mixed box. I want some churro in the box. I want some peanut butter brownie. But hey, if you want those built bars right now, head to your local Walmart or Sam's Club today. There at Walmart, you can go to the pharmacy section, grab yourself a four bar box of their cookies and cream, the double chocolate, or the coconut puffs. Or if you're closer to a Sam's Club, run in there, grab yourself a 13 bar box. Of their hit flavors, the brownie batter or the churro. You can thank me later. Go to Sam's Club or Walmart to get your built bars today. Which player can the New York Mets least afford to lose to injury this season? When we go across the lineup, I think there's some areas where you can afford to lose a player. I think we'll start with the players that ultimately could be replaced this year anyway. So that's your Eduardo Escobar because you got coverage with Guillaume, you got coverage with Danny Mendick, and then, of course, you have the up-and-coming coverage of a Brett Beatty who could just take Escobar's job and even a Mark Vientos, and even beyond that, a Ronnie Mauricio potentially down the line. I think he still needs the most seasoning. He certainly does compared to the other prospects, but there's a lot of coverage at third base, right? You go over to you know, left field or catcher. These, again, are positions where the Mets probably could potentially upgrade. Left field, not as much with Mark Canna, and I think he's very durable. But 
if Cano went down, you could sustain it. If you lose Nervaez or Nito, you could find another defensive-minded catcher to slot in, and you still have the upside of Alvarez waiting in the wings. And even in left field, if Cano went down, you potentially could put a Brett Beatty out in left field. You look at DH, Daniel Vogelback goes down. You can find some guys that can get the at-bats. Really, it comes down to the core four or the core five. I think the core four is the groups that you really think you're building around for a long, long period with Jeff McNeil, Pete Alonzo, Francisco Lindor, and Brandon Nemo. But then you still have a three-year window where Starling Marte is part of that. If those guys go down, it's tougher to sustain. Ironically enough, of that group, in some ways, the Mets have more coverage for Pete Alonzo than the others, at least when it comes to the position aspect of this, because you could put Daniel Vogel back at first base if you really wanted to, and Buck Showalter actually applauded him for his defense lately, which is a little bit surprising, but he said he looks good in camp at the position. He did trim up a little bit over the offseason, so maybe he can field some first base a little bit better. You have the upside play of Mark Vientos, who can go play some first base if you had to. If you wanted to shift Escobar over to first, you could. Mark Canna has played some first in his career. The Mets have options at first base. Now, with that said, to lose Pete Alonso's bat in the middle of the lineup is a devastating blow. The good thing about Pete, though, he is very durable throughout his career. We'll knock on wood on that one, but you look at Pete Alonso throughout his career that dates back to 2019, he missed a game then. He played in 57 out of 60 in this shortened season. He played in 152 out of 162 in 2021. When he did go on the 10-day IL, he just missed You know that window, came right back into the lineup. And then last year, he played in 160. So Pete has been extremely durable. I think he'll continue to be that. You can't really afford to lose that bat, but I actually could see the Mets getting by without him for a stretch because of how much I believe in the upside of one of the prospects filling in that gap. You look at Francisco Lindor. How do you replace Francisco Lindor? Uh, And he's been remarkably durable in his career, too. When he went down in 2021, say what you want about Lindor's season. When he went down, the team seemed to start to go on the skids, you know, and, and he got back and was good in September, but it was almost too late to save him. Having his defense out there every day, I think that he might be the player the Mets can least afford to lose because the fall off is the most significant. Like, The fall-off from Pete Alonso to Mark Vientos, while steep in a sense that the offense is nowhere near what Pete you can trust, Vientos has some upside. And defensively, even though I think Vientos is really criticized a lot for his defense, I mean, it's not like Pete Alonso is the greatest defender in the world. He's gotten much better, but I think Vientos can hang his own at the position and even if they had to go another route with it. You look at... Lindor, yes, you can slot Yorme in there every single day at shortstop and defensively. You're not taking the biggest of hits, but you are taking a hit. Like As great as Yorme is at second base and third base, and he is a good shortstop, Lindor's a great shortstop. I don't know if Louis Yorme is a great shortstop. So there is a, a, a tick back there. If you put Mendick out there, same thing defensively, there's a tick, and the offense drops off a cliff. Now, the other player that you'd have to look at, though, is Brandon Nemo in center. I mean, to lose Brandon Nimmo, where do you go? You could slide Canna into center. You could slide Marte into center. But then you're hurting yourself in either corner. The good thing is you have Jeff McNeil in that instance where if uh, Nimmo went down, you could slide Canna into center, McNeil out to left, and you could get by. You can suddenly take the left field platoon of Mark Canna and Tommy Pham, shift them into center field, and have McNeil out left every day. So that's... Another possibility for the Mets. McNeil does give them some coverage out there, but to lose a Nimmo, I think he's the outfielder you can least afford to lose. Marte is maybe the biggest injury at risk. We're going to get into next year is who's the biggest injury at risk. It might be Starling Marte. When he went down in September, we also saw the Mets fall off in 2022, this last season, where you know I still wholeheartedly believe if Starling Marte doesn't go down, this Mets team wins that division. So those are the two guys in the outfield where you need to have at least one. If both of them go down, the Mets are going to be hurting, and you might have to trade more than you want to to go get a Brian Reynolds from Pittsburgh or something like that because 
And, and you also don't want to be in that that position where you have to trade for a weakness that opens up due to injury because then you're just in a world of hurt. And honestly, that's where I look back at the Jake Mangum trade and continue to rethink it and, and like it less. I really think that Jake Mangum is a guy that would have been the perfect fourth outfielder for this team because if nothing else, he would have been the second best center fielder on that 40 man roster, even potentially the, the best. I don't even know in a vacuum how, how he would compare defensively to a Nemo, but I also think this is a guy that has a much higher floor offensively than people give him credit for. I think Jazz Chisholm out in, in Miami is going to struggle so much defensively in center that they're going to abandon that experiment at some point and maybe they move a rise back to first and Chisholm to second. And I think Jake Mangum can win himself a starting center field job on that team because he's going to be the best defender and a guy that can go out and, and probably hit 270 at the big league level and get on base at a decent clip and maybe run into 10 home runs. So I, I think the Mets maybe made a mistake there. I think Jeff Brigham could be a nice reliever in this pen, and I understand uh, that trade in the sense that they got pitching depth through their rotation and their bullpen, and maybe they were doing Mangum a solid as an older prospect and saying, look, we're going to send you somewhere you can play. Uh, that could be part of it. But I do think that in some ways, the coverage that the Mets have in the outfield overall is a little bit worse than they have in the infield. Yet, with that said, I still lean towards Francisco Lindor as the player the Mets can least afford to lose. The only other one would be Jeff McNeil because of that versatility that he brings. But if you're just simply talking about filling a void at second base, if he were to go down, I think that Guillaume gives you such great defense that at least you're looking at the floor of someone who I think if Guillaume was to start for a team and play 160 games at second base because of the defensive value he brings, I still think you're looking at a two and a half to a, a three win player. Uh, and obviously McNeil last year was close to a six win player, but you could work around a second baseman that's giving you great defense and getting on base at a 350 clip. And I think Guillaume is that. So, all of that, again, is to say that Francisco Lindor is the position player and probably the player on the roster the Mets can least afford to lose. But I would give Brandon Nimmo a very close second on that based on just the lack of depth the Mets have to sustain an injury to center field. Next, though, which player is the biggest injury risk on this team? We're going to get to that in a minute. First, though, I want to tell you about LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you can have access to the best qualified candidates available. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs will help you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Then all you got to do, add your job, the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. And then LinkedIn Jobs is going to provide you with simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and the experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to hire and who you'd like to, or who you'd like to interview and then hire. Let's interview them first before we hire them. It's why small businesses run LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Who is the biggest injury risk on the New York Mets? The entire starting rotation is old, so there's just that element of an injury risk. And Kodai Sanga coming over from Japan, new baseball, um, you know, a lot that he has to adjust to. We have seen at times international player comes over. You look at Shohei Otani needed Tommy John early, so you never really know. And there has been some rumblings about some issues in Senga's medical that the Mets had to work through, and that was ultimately why they got him at a relatively uh, team-friendly discount. But I, I think that the bigger injury risks ultimately still lie in the position player court. And also, moreover, like pitchers always get hurt. So you can't necessarily say where the injury risk lies in the rotation of the bullpen. It's just simply the fact that throwing a baseball is extremely unnatural, and any of these guys can go down at any time. So let's zero in on the players that are the biggest injury risks. And we'll start with those two guys in the outfield, Brandon Nemo, Starling Marte. 
you look at Nimmo's career, comes up, we won't even judge the, the 2016 season. 2017, runs into injuries, plays 69 games. Uh, you go to 2018, played 140, healthiest he had been. Then it was 69 games played. He was healthy for the 2020 season. Played 92 games in 2021. Then last year, finally put it all together and played 151. While Brandon Nimmo has been an injury risk throughout his career, though, I actually don't think he is as big of an injury risk as Starling Marte because not only did he come off a year where he was healthy, you know, he is more in the prime of his career. He's going to turn 30 uh, in March, at the end of March. So he athletically just might not be at that point where Starling Marte is this uber-athletic guy that's now entering his mid-30s. He turned 34 in October last year. We saw him play 118 games. And that's the thing is Starling Marte, while he has gotten over 100 games played, he's always due for some type of an injury, whether it's a hamstring pull, whether it's a core injury like it was last year. Sometimes when guys are built like Marte, as chiseled as he is, they might be a little bit more prone to those types of you know soft tissue injuries, right? So I don't know exactly you know which guy's going to go down. We can never project it. But if I had to to be more concerned about one of them, I think it's Marte, particularly because he got some core muscle surgery over the off season. We still haven't even seen him in spring. So I just don't know if he is going to hold up and play 150, considering the fact that he hasn't done that since 2015. He was 135 games played in 2013, 135 games in 2014, 153. Then it was 129. Then he had the suspension uh, where it was down to 77. He played 145 in 2018, 132 in 2019. He did play an extra game. He played more games than anyone in the shortened season because he got traded. Uh, I played 61, 2021, 120, last year, 118. I think he's due to miss about 40 games a year. And if he played 120, if you could tell me right now, I get 120 games from Starling Marte in each of the next three years, and I never get more than that, I'd sign up for it. Because what you don't want is a season where Starling Marte is out for half of it. So as long as he's out there and he only misses like a month of the season at some point, I, I think you take it. Uh, but I think Brandon Nimmo could very well go out and do what he did last year and play 150 again. So uh, I think that's where the the biggest risk lies, especially the risk t- attached to how good the player is. You look at Mark Canna. Uh, I mean, the guy has been fairly durable. Uh, in the last few years, he's played 140. And I think last year, you know, the, the games he missed were due to, you know, sitting on the bench, not because of any injury. He was healthy in 2020, so he's got three years under his belt of being healthy. And before that, there was injury. So so there is that in his past, but I think he's figured it out. Here's a guy that gets hit more than anyone and finds his way into the lineup. Uh, I think you feel pretty good about that. I think you feel pretty good about Lindor and Alonso and their durability. I think Jeff McNeil is another guy that has gone down at times, but last year he played a career-high 148 games. Uh, you know, the year before he played 120, and... He did miss a little bit of time in the shortened season, and you look at 2019, he played 133. So, you know, there's always some injury risk for any of these guys. I think I'm most concerned about Marte and Nimmo, again, based on what else you have behind them and their past. Uh, But, again, anybody can get hurt at any time. Uh, Beyond that, though, I mean... I don't even know where else you would really look and be too concerned. Eduardo Escobar has been pretty durable throughout his career. Um, you know, Daniel Vogelback, I guess, might be a little bit of an injury risk, but he's going to be DHing, so you would think you should be able to keep him upright. And then, you know, all these young kids, you would hope that they'd be durable because you know, the freshest, youngest legs you got. And uh, we'll, we'll see exactly how much run each of them ultimately gets. But I think the Mets. You know, they have some coverage uh, w- with those guys. They have some coverage in the corners. You know, being able to throw a Brett Beatty into left if you had to or put somebody at third base, even first base. It's up the middle that you're always the most worried because it's tough for teams to have depth up the middle because those are the toughest positions to field. And, again, losing a Lindor, a Nemo, a Marte, uh, those are the guys I-, I am most concerned about 
Uh, if you get a healthy season and of all those guys at the Mets are going to be in a great position to do some big, big things in the National League East. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Fickelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked on Mets. Thank you for making Locked on Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out Locked on Fantasy Baseball. There you can learn how to win your leagues. Let's not go out and have a bad year of fantasy baseball. You can find it wherever you get your podcast. You find them on YouTube. Check out Locked on Fantasy Baseball today.